So what I'll do is I'll, I'll just kind of introduce you to panel uh, members. We have a fantastic panel. But before we do that, you know, this is the last day of Casual Connect. I just want to thank the organizers. It's been a fantastic show. Let's give them a big hand. As you know, Casual Connect is really not about the panelists or moderator, it's really about you. The idea is to create this in a knowledge base and share the knowledge and experience with the community so that it's really, it really benefits all of us. Um, so I'm going to start with Henry Lowenfels, David Lauke, and Ninel Gruner. And you've seen their backgrounds, but I'll just, I'm going to ask them to talk about their backgrounds and, and you know, how relevant, uh, whatever, you know, in terms of their experience regarding the financing and fundraising for game companies. And they, although David is an investor, he's been a great entrepreneur, so he'll have both sides of the, you know, the story. But Henrik, let's start with you. Sure, sure. Um, so I guess a uh, quick background on myself. I started my career as a film producer, uh, slightly tangential to the game industry. But I think I've always been in a position raising capital, sort of figuring out ways to bring content to life, working with really smart creatives and uh, figuring out how to make a buck doing it. So uh, that's kind of been my career at a high level. I've been at Scopely for about two and a half years. It's been a really exciting time. I started when we were about 20 people and now we're about 110, um, thanks to these guys and, and some of our other investors. Fairly well capitalized now, just announced a $35 million Series A in November. Um, and probably best known for some of our casual games like Dice with Buddies, creator of Dice with Buddies who spoke yesterday sitting out in the audience, um, one of our biggest games to date, mini golf matchup which was the number one game in 49 countries, um, and some really big titles to come this year, uh, some stuff in the social casino space, some mid-core titles, and um, really moving into some exciting genres with a variety of developers. So very exciting time to be at Scopely. You can see how he managed to raise so much money, can't you? Uh, so I'm David Lauke from uh, London Venture Partners. We're a boutique um, venture capitalist based out of London, investing primarily in Europe, though we will look elsewhere, uh, and typically at the, uh, at the very early stage, so seed uh, or even the startup stage. Um, and uh, we, we, we've, just to give you an example of some of the, uh, the, the people that we've been involved in, myself with my partners David Gardner and Paul Hayden have been backers of companies like Unity Technologies, Playfish, uh, natural motion, um, a small company out of Helsinki called Supercell, uh, and, and a bunch of others. Um, but, and, okay, so here's the truth of it. I'm up here as a VC, but the, the, the truth is I'm not really a VC. Uh, I'm, I'm a technologist and a game developer. I started developing games in 1988, started the studio, built it up, uh, and sold it, and got into investing kind of by the side route. And that's the case for my two other partners as well. Paul is an investment banker, but he's basically games orientated. David Gardner, again, is a games guy. So we only invest in games and the game sector. Um, and, and that's what we do. You know? Hi, I'm Ninel Gruner. I'm a marketing officer of Roommate Studio. It's a Ukrainian-based uh, game development studio. We also recently opened the office uh, in the um, uh, United Kingdom, in London. Um, we are um, specialized in game development. Uh, we actually raised money a few months after we started, um, which were like uh, in a few rounds more than uh, $1 million for uh, building our own games and working with other companies as well. So um, we built our company from the scratch. Now we're about 80 people, which is, I don't think which is huge or, or small studio. I feel like we are okay. I don't want to grow anymore. Maybe, maybe in future to be a um, successful publishing or something, but not for now. Um, we have been working with uh, maybe major publishers on the market like Chilingo and DNA, working with uh, Asian companies, European, uh, American, which was a good platform for us as a studio. Um, we, you might have known um, our recent title, Piano City, which has been also featured by the App Store and getting more and more users um, every day and getting a, actually a great success on, on the market now. Thank you. Thank you. You know, the beautiful thing about the game market is that, especially mobile game, you can have a team in Ukraine could be an overnight success globally, right? It really sort of connects all of us. Um, so, you know, our, our intent was to really give you three different perspectives. You know, 
uh, you know, Scopely has built a massive platform and network. They're getting ready for the next stage of growth. And Ninel and her team, they have, they have an extremely talented team with very you know, interesting and fascinating ideas. And David has done everything. So and you'll hear again from all of them from their perspectives. And before we do that, just talk about the context, you know, where the industry is, where it's going. As you know, for a lot of game companies, especially early stage game companies, it's been a pretty difficult 18 months or so. Although historically, uh, if you look at the trends, 2014 last year was a better year than the preceding three years. You know, the best year was around 2010, 2011. Last year was uh, better than the preceding two, three years. And primarily uh, coming from robust M&A and IPO. And if you look at, you know, Minecraft and, and natural motion, all these, you know, transactions really sort of fuel the uh, market dynamics. And as the consolidation starts, you know, taking place, you have also the companies are ready to go public. So you have King, went public Gumi in uh, December, and, and also iDream Sky. So again, it's a global phenomenon. Overall, about a $24 billion M&A and IPO activity in 2014. And what that really means is that investors are now coming back to the game sector, although not as aggressively as they were, say, four years ago. And a part of the challenge is, as you guys know, is user acquisition is extremely expensive. So if you look at the top 10, out of top 10, you have three from King, three, uh, three from Supercell, and you have Machine Zone, and you have, uh, well, you have Big Fish Casino, and then, you know, EA just came up there because of the Madden NFL, but tri primarily you have about two casino games and six, you know, sim strategy, each three from King and Supercell. It's really tough to get up to top 10, top 20, and top 10 tends to get about close to 60% of overall app store revenues, and top 20 gets about 70 plus percent. So really for a game company starting, you know, getting the funding, getting this sort of user acquisition model fine-tuned, and also, you know, the main objective is to come up with an awesome game. It's a huge challenge. So the question to the panel members is really, from your perspective, especially, you know, some of you covering multiple geographies, and we'll start with David. Uh, David, you know, given your experience, What's your advice? What are your observations? And what do you recommend? Um, I, I, I think that I mean, the number one point that you hit there is, is, is just about user acquisition. How do you get your great product out there? <clears throat> and um, you know, with all of this, I, I, let me preface it by saying that you know, the starting point is having a great game, of course. But, but ultimately, you know, that's not sufficient. You, know, you need to be able to somehow get it up to the charts. I was just reading a statistic today, for example. If you go for free to play and you're looking to get into the top 50, really you need an acquisition spend of, of something like a, around about sort of forty to $50,000 a day to get it into the top 50. That's just the top 50. And, and of course, there's an exponential curve that means that the higher you get up, the more you're going to bring in. So very, very expensive to try to get into the top 50 that way. There are other ways of doing it. Of course, there are things like... Um, um, uh, I, I don't know if you guys know Fun Run. I guess you probably do from Dirty Bit Games. A really incredible game uh, where, where they've had something like 70 million downloads without spending a single cent on user acquisition. So clearly there are ways of doing it. And I think that you know, certainly what, what we like to see when, when, we, when we engage with a company very early on is uh, not just something really interesting in terms of the core game mechanic, the core loops and so on, but also people understanding that that's not sufficient. You need as well as that to be integrating the monetization loops if it's free to play and integrating the engagement loops as well, all of which are going to help you essentially with your user acquisition through driving down your eCPIs, making sure that the cost of getting out there uh, to your users is really great. And then, of course, you know, the number one thing, the number one thing as far as I'm concerned is retention. Yeah, so really having an incredibly tight, strong grip on what you're doing about retention, having targets uh, that, that you're looking to achieve there. I think just finally on this, um, Again, you know, there's a fantastic, if you look at the top charts, uh, the top 100 on, on, on the App Store, for example, uh, and you can look at the different genres that are there, you can see what works and what doesn't work. And, um, you know, something like 30% of, of the top 100 is things like match three games. Very, very difficult to break into that segment now, right, because it's pretty much owned by one or two major players. So their ability to be able to acquire users are more efficiently or effective than, than a startup can is, just means that it's, it's in some ways kind of closed to new entrants. So for me, I'm a gamer, I want to see new ideas, new concepts, uh, but making sure that from day one, you're integrating uh, you know, thoughts about retention, engagement, and monetization. You know, you, you and your team, you guys have global ambitions and you've done some fundraising locally. 
So what, what has been your experience and, and what do you see sort of the market uh, dynamics from your perspective as you, you know, talk degrees and DNAs and so forth from the fundraising pers perspective? Um, so as, as you have said, um, recently the venture fund had uh, started not to invest that much in the gaming industry. Uh, of course, they want to in, uh, invest there because the, if the game is profitable, it's really, really profitable. You cannot get that much money from doing, I don't know, selling pants, so the margin from uh, doing games. But um, most of the developers, especially just the ones who are starting their business, they're thinking more of, you know, that's, it's, it's fun, it's creative, uh, but it's not about business. So so, uh, you know, when starting doing the game and, you know, thinking of raising money for it, first, you don't have to do the game that you like. You have to do the marketing research, do the production research on whether uh, there is a market for this game now and there would be the market for this game once you finish it. I mean, uh, if, the mar if now the Hearthstone is popular, it doesn't necessarily mean that in a year it still will be popular with the same mechanic. I mean, if you just do the clone. So you have to think about evolving the existing mechanics and thinking what will be interesting for the users uh, in a year, maybe two years, depending on how long is the production cycle. So uh, really start thinking of what your audience is uh, lacking rather than what you want to um, your audience to play because uh, it doesn't necessarily mean they will do that. Yeah. So, um, and um, I believe that uh, once, people once, once people understand that, they're going to be more, you know, uh, effective in raising funds for, uh, for the games they're doing. And especially uh, people just f uh, forget about um, build that gaming industry is still a business and you have to build your, uh, your workflows, your production cycles, your processes inside the studio, just, rather than just, you know, creating fun and interesting stuff. <laughs> Uh, on the fundraising side, is your sort of long-term plan to raise money from, you know, regional or you, when you talk to, you know, the partners in Japan and South Korea, are, do you have plans to talk to some of the maybe investors in that region or you're looking at maybe publishers helping you on the fundraising side? Uh, it's hard to say right now because uh, uh, for now we are okay with the current funds we're having and with uh, current profits we're having. Yeah. Uh, we're now more focused on developing uh, our current portfolio and current games, gaining more experience. And uh, once we hit some uh, specific KPIs, uh, that will be, you know, um, good for our company. Then we're going to think about raising the other uh, rounds of money. Because um, if you have money for marketing, it doesn't necessarily mean you can't do marketing. Mm. If you have read about marketing and you think that, okay, uh, if my LTV is $2 and the CPI is $1, I'm going to buy, go and buy marketing. No, it doesn't work like this. So uh, you better first gain the experience rather than just spending money on something. Okay. Henry, you guys have done a great job of fundraising and actually you've been very creative early days, sort of different, you know, sort of financing vehicles and then turned it into a big uh, financing run. Could you share some of your experiences? Sure. Well, I, I think Ninel hit the nail on the head when she referenced thinking about where the market's going. Um, I think a big part of why we've been successful in raising capital is that we've really, and I credit the founders, um, you know, Walter and, and Anker and Eric and Eitan for really having a great vision of, of where the market was heading. And I think, you know, kind of taking a step back to where we started, the, the theory was kind of born out of things that Walter experienced when he was making social games, things that we saw right in our backyard in Hollywood where, you know, what happens in just about every entertainment medium from books to TV to movies to music is that there is a separation of um, the folks who are distributing and publishing and marketing content and the folks who are actually making it. Um, you know, if you're a film director, you'd kind of be crazy to think that you can go out and compete with Warner Brothers and getting a movie out to audiences. And I think, you know, the same type of thing is happening now um, and will continue happening in the mobile gaming market. Despite being able to go sign into iTunes Connect and push a game to the store, it's increasingly not the best idea and maybe not the best option for a company that's not extraordinarily well capitalized and, as Nanel referenced, you know, really set up with the tech tools and expertise to be able to operate properly, not just spend money, but spend money effectively and intelligently. So I think, you know, what we really have tried to do is to, is to focus on specific areas that, that we feel um, are scalable, focus on areas that we feel are not 
being dominated by other players currently um, and, and really sort of look out maybe even a few years, maybe even being a little bit ahead of where the market is in saying, hey, this is where the opportunity is headed and we're going to build towards that so that two years from now when the best developers in the world all realize that, you know, that one hit wonder success that they had, um, you know, it's not sustainable. They need support. They need help scaling their games. They need to be able to do more than they can on their own and they want to focus on really content creation. We want to be there. We want to be set up to work with these guys in the, in the most leveraged way possible. So I think sort of in a nutshell, that's kind of how we've been able to position ourselves and, and raise, you know, multiple successful rounds. Uh, you know, you actually have a dual role as a publisher and developer. So in a sense, you're an investor. And I don't know how much you can share with the audience when you talk to a group, say, from any region in Europe or any other place, what are you looking for and what kind of funding that or financing that you guys can provide? Yeah, so I, it, it is interesting. I kind of sit in the middle. I was saying to Marco last night, I, I sort of, on one hand, you know, um, I'm sitting in Yanel's shoes here trying to look for capital. On the other hand, I'm sitting in David's shoes, you know, sort of having people approach us, um, looking for capital for their projects. So it's a really interesting dynamic. And I think on both sides, um, what I look for and, and what I think, um, you know, we've, we've done fairly well at Scopely is focus. Uh, you know, and, and really understanding your core strengths and, and how to um, build on them. So when I, when someone comes to me looking for financing for their game and, and they've made, you know, five strategy games before and they say they want to go make, uh, you know, a runner, that's a little crazy. You know, I, I don't really fully get the through line that, that's happening there. You know, now if they're saying, hey, we've, we've built these core competencies and our back end is built out and now we're going to leverage what we've built to take it to a new genre, now I start to understand it and, and I kind of get that focus. Um, so it's not necessarily saying every developer has to be confined to a category or a genre, but I look for trajectory. You know, I think, I think that's something that's really important. You know, has every game been more exciting, more innovative? Um, has it been pushing the, the limits of, of what the team can do? And do they seem like they're headed for bigger things to come because I think no one wants to invest in someone who's sort of peaked or no or you know is, is kind of at their prime um, you kind of always want to be investing for that potential so I think that's a way that we've tried to position ourselves that's something that really excites me um, I think there are a lot of teams out there who who aren't supercell yet who aren't the, the big obvious players but you can kind of sense that you know they've been doing this for a while they've been studying the market and when you talk to someone who, who really has that level of focus and who says I want to make a match three game and hey let me tell you all the ten things that are going on in, in the top 25 match three games that's what you want to hear what I don't like hearing which is happens more often than I, than I would care to admit is, you know, I'm a huge gamer and when I sit down with someone they say, hey, I'm making an RTS game and I go, cool, did you check out that Samurai Siege thing that they're doing last weekend? And they're like, no idea. That's not really a good sign. You need to be an expert and you really need to have that kind of domain expertise really just come through in everything you're talking about. Right. David, uh, I know the name is London Venture Partners, but you guys are actually global. So when you look at the regional subtleties and, and shifts and trends and, and really, again, start looking at early stage game companies, what are your, you know, uh, sort of, uh, I guess, insights uh, yeah. when you... Yeah, and, 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 I'll, and I'll, I'll come to that in a minute, but I, first of all, I just want to um, provide an, an, a sort of more context around uh, um, the comments we just had there. I think that what, one of the things that I love about uh, how the game industry has changed is because we've gone digital, it's all about disintermediation, which means that you as developers can reach your audience directly. Right? And the way it used to work, again, if you were working in AAA days doing console stuff and so on, is that as a developer, you were bottom of the food chain, right? And you had a publisher in between you and your customers, right? What we're finding now is that um, certain types of developers can go direct to, con direct to consumers. And if you look at the people that we've been involved in, that's what's happened. So if you want to generate maximum value for your, for your, for your organization, your company, that's a way of doing it. Now, what we've heard here is quite right. Um, that's incredibly difficult. So along that journey, it make, makes a, a lot of sense to work with someone who can provide that kind of access through doing a publishing deal with you. But it's not the only way of doing things. I think that's probably fair to say. Absolutely, totally um, agree. In, in, ter in terms of uh, geographies and, and so on, what we see, um, we, Europe particularly, and the reason that you know, we're, 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 we're called London Venture Partners through accident, we managed to get the, the main name, there you go. Um, but we do, uh, uh, you know, as Marcus says, we, 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 we do look globally. It happens that most of our investments are in Europe. And the reason they're in Europe is because um, there's an overabundance of talent and an, an undersupply of capital. 
So from our perspective, it, it just makes sense for us to be operating mostly in Europe. That's part of the reason. The other reason is that, uh, um, and again, when you go out there looking for money, um, there's this sort of, it's, it's, it's kind of a facile sort of positioning, but people talk about dumb money versus smart money. And, and what do they mean by that? And, 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 and that's really important because when you're raising money, you really need to think, you know, what does it come with? Uh, if you've got something that's great, actually you're going to have a number of different uh, um, sources for your, for your capital, for your investment. So it's down to you to try to pick who's going to be the best for you, the best value for you. And that comes down to what can they add, what can they provide beyond just the money. And if it's just the money that you want, what I'd suggest is don't even bother coming to us. Yeah, because we're not going to be the, your, your cheapest uh, uh, supply of money at all. But what we do is bring added value because we've been operative in the game sector for, for 20 plus years. So our networks are incredible, you know, and we understand the process of de development. We've worked through building companies from a one-man band uh, uh, up to, you know, billion dollar organizations. So we understand that process. So the value we can, we can bring is, is, a, is a great deal more. So that's another reason why we're operating primarily in Europe because we, we like and we want to engage with the companies we get involved in. Uh, so Europe's still very, very interesting for us. The US um, is, again, you know, if you, if, you want to, if you want to learn how to produce a great pitch which gets VCs excited, you've, you've got to look at how they do it in the US because there there's a fantastic integration typically of not just the creative and, and, the, and the technical and the passion for games, it's also the ambition, all right? The ambition to change the world, the ambition to be gigantic, to be huge, and not shying away from facing up to the commercial realities of that. So there's a much more integrated approach and a pitch that tends to come from North America than typically we, we do here in Europe. Here we, we tend to undersell it a little bit. Um, so you get, I think, much bigger pictures, much bigger ideas coming out of, uh, uh, out of the US. Um, in Asia, I mean, again, with mobile and, uh, and, and so on, um, the Asian markets work very, very differently. They're hugely advanced in all sorts of ways, very, very good at targeting their specific demographics, less good at thinking about how they produce global phenomenons. So it's really interesting. I mean, here in the West, as a developer, you know, you can make stuff and you always think, how do I crack the Asian market? It's so difficult, it's so different. Actually, Asian developers are thinking exactly the same thing about how they get into the Western market. So it's, an, again, interesting uh, differences that exist between the two. Thank you. Ninal, when you sort of look at your game development and your pipeline, and I think part of the past discussion was about branded IP, and it would be great to have a branded IP on the, the you know, monetization engine that you guys are developing. And that really creates another conundrum for fundraising because branded IP usually comes with minimum guarantees and so forth. Have you guys thought about that? And do you see, I mean, we see that a lot in, in the US. Obviously, Kim Kardashian game did a lot. And again, that requires, you know, upfront money or some guarantees. and and Glue announced Katy Perry right after Super Bowl. That's another, you know, probably mega hit for them. Um, it's really hard when you're a small studio, one of the branded IP. Have you guys looked into acquiring some uh, sort of content that has, you know, sort of a larger appeal? And what that really means from the fundraising perspective? So, uh, yes, acquiring a license for, for the game is actually, has actually been a very, you know, massive trend for most every well-known company. Uh, but most of the developers actually forget that uh, just acquiring the license, uh, it's one procedure. And then making your game uh, to be, um, to suit this license uh, is actually another story because uh, the licensing company they check every art material, everything like at every point at every stage, which actually prolongs the development process and makes your life like a hell. We're actually working with um, um, music uh, labels for our Piano City uh, okay. game and acquiring uh, licenses for for music uh, inside the game, which is actually a quite um, long and um, exhausting procedure. Uh, of course, we would. Uh, we are considering uh, going uh, with a license for our current game. As uh, I mean, it's a music game, so uh, getting users acquired, like let's say having Lady Gaga on the icon, will be much. Um, much. Uh, it will be less in terms of marketing spans because when user see like let's say. Uh, I don't know, Piano City, what is Piano City for, for major, like millions and millions users. But uh, when it comes like Lady Gaga on the icon, like I know Lady Gaga, let's check it out, what is there. So um, 
licensing is a very cool thing uh, when it comes to huge marketing spans, so it uh, makes you spend less. So yes, we're considering also um, going with a license, already talking to some um, agencies and providing some um, like um, the media faces to our game. Okay. In the game. Yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting what we're seeing also in, in the US market that they're obviously, you know, in this room and, and, and beyond, there are a lot of talented developers and designers. Sometimes they get access to the IP based on the quality of the team, and then they go out and raise money. I think, Henry, you've been working with some of them. Yeah. So their fundraising is that we're, we're selected by XYZ Studio for this big title coming out or movie coming out. Now we have to do fundraising. Yeah, we've, we've seen some of that. Um, you know, we've been very active in the world of IP uh, lately. We'll be rolling out some titles this year, uh, several of which are against some fairly large licenses. Very excited to be able to talk about that. Um, but yeah, no, I think it, it does come down to ability to execute and to, and to the team. And it, it's like, you know, I think you ask uh, any VC what they look at, you know, most, and, and generally what they'll say is, is it's the team, right? And, and I think that, you know, when you're controlling a big media property, um, one of the biggest movies in the world or a TV show, there's a lot at risk there, and, and there's a lot that you have to lose. There's certainly big upside, but I think what all these licensors are looking for is, is safety. I mean, it comes in the form of an MG sometimes, um, you know, to, to guarantee that they're not going to lose their shirt on this, and even if it all goes wrong, there's at least some dollars that they can go tell their boss they, they brought in. But oftentimes it comes in the form of talent, and, and the team says, or a licensor says, hey, look, I know these guys can make a killer game, I know they can do something really special, and I want them representing my brand, and, and now let's figure out a way to bring that to life. So we, we've seen both of those things. I think part of the benefit of obviously the brand is the user acquisition, right? Because you, I mean, your best uh, acquisition strategy is to get li in aligned with the app stores. Uh, you know, if you get major featuring from Apple or Google, that's really the best, you know, uh, obviously coverage you can get and, and, and best, you know, very effective marketing strategy. And uh, David, you know, when you talk to the you know, developers coming to talk to you and, and obviously you guys have a phenomenal track record with Unity and Supercell, and what do you think, what's the sort of the biggest thing they're missing in terms of their assumptions on, on, on go-to-market and, and strategy? The, yeah, so, and again, this, this, these comments are about London Venture Partners and what we do. Um, other VCs approach the world in, in, in a different fashion. But remembering that, you know, we are seed and early stage, so we're talking typically about very small companies. The number one issue tends to be people come to us saying, you know, we've got this great game, we're halfway through development, give us this much money, we'll be able to finish it and launch it. That's kind of not what we're looking for. We don't do project finance, you know. We're, we're, we're trying to invest in, in the next great companies. So we almost always take the view, if you come to us, uh, and you're, you're, you're a small team of four, six people, um, you know, looking to grow and develop, we almost always take the view that your first game is going to be a complete and utter failure and probably your second and maybe your third. So, so we're, we're kind of looking to see that you've thought that process through uh, and that you're saying, you know what, uh, with this much money, two, three million dollars, whatever it happens to be, we've got a runway of say 18 months, 24 months, and that's gonna give us enough time to be able to iterate on these great ideas we've got, you know, and here's why they're great and what we're gonna do about it and so on. So that's part of the process, uh, understanding that we're investing in a company, yeah, so it's a process we're investing in and helping you develop that. Uh, and the other side to it is making sure that you've, you've matched up your, your, your game chops, you know, understanding what you want in terms of gameplay and so on with that commercial side to it as well. So what are you gonna do to ensure that, that you know, you're gonna market this thing effectively and efficiently. How's that gonna work? And again, for us, um, we tend to shy away from the stuff that these guys like, for example. So we'd shy away if you came to us and said, we're gonna acquire a license. We'd be like, okay, great, but that's probably better for somebody else. We want you to be the licensors of your IP. So we want you to create it and then license it, if you like, rather than the other way around. And yes, that takes a bunch of time. Um, uh, likewise, if you came to us and said, we're doing this, but we're going to be working through this third party publisher. For us, that probably doesn't work. You know, we're very early stage. We, we, we'd be looking to figure out how we can help you become the next supercell, you know, rather than the next company who's producing fantastic stuff and has a great business, but it's actually being distributed uh, or published by somebody else. Yeah, talking about supercell, and you know, if you look at what they've done with Boom Beach, they 
basically, uh, they were in beta over nine months or so, right? They, uh, they were in Canada. They were fine-tuning the game and the whole progression model and user funnels and, and you, know, the you know, the pinch points and first conversion and so forth. But not very many people can do that. So, Ninel, when you guys go out there with a new game and you're obviously budgeting for beta period, then you have to go and market it. So what are you doing from the marketing perspective? What are the strategies to really sort of stretch your dollars or euros uh, far uh, so that you know, the financing that you, you know, acquired or obtained uh, lasts you a long time going through the, this very critical time period? Okay, so um, first of all, we always do the uh, sort of soft launch. Yeah. And we don't go out from the soft launch before we think that the game is, like, let's say, ready for yeah. going global. Because uh, you have to tune your, of course, your progression, uh, how how the users behave in, in, inside the game, whether they're interested or just they cannot even pass the tutorial. So we have a very very deep um, analytic points inside the game. So like we are tracking like tons of events. We uh, have uh, special monetization managers and analyst, uh, analytics managers that help us to build all this kind of economy inside the game so um, it's not worth it to go uh, outside like to go globally uh, if you don't think you know the game is ready to perform that to perform there because of obviously it's uh, marketing expense and it's still a business so you get uh, you have to get your money back once you spend them mm -hmm. of course uh, there's actually a very good thing um, told by David that um, you better find the um, VCs or uh, venture um, like angel invest investors that are um, in gaming business or do understand gaming business because um, you have to have the support so your first game can fail or uh, sometimes it uh, the game needs like even a year or something like Megapolis from Social Quan, I believe it became profitable, like properly profitable after a year and a half or something. So um, if you see the potential, if your KPIs are growing, you have to continue working and adjusting the game. So um, we really feel with our game, now it has been three months in soft launch and then we're around five months out and we uh, still don't think it's polished like enough to be like a super um, like top chart project so uh, we have to um, put their new features with every update and see how the users behave because of them maybe delete them after the uh, the previous update so you have to track the KPIs all the time yeah. Can I just give you a very concrete tip on how to make your uh, your, your user acquisition uh, dollars go a little bit further. Um, everybody knows that Canada's used an awful lot because it's a, it's a great proxy for the US and, and, and that's exactly the case. The number one thing, certainly on early soft launch you're looking for, or we're looking for anyway, is retention and retention metrics. Uh, the Philippines uh, is a very, very good proxy for retention in, in the US and it's much cheaper to acquire users there. So if what you're te testing is retention, go there. Uh, you'll be able to acquire your cohort of users uh, much more cheaply than you would in Canada. Yeah, and uh, I think going back to the sort of David's and Ninel's comments on finding the right investor. Obviously, if you need capitals, you know, you want to be creative, get the money you know, from whatever the uh, source might be. But, um, you know, going through this experience and you develop a great game, you go through beta and then you still have to fine tune it. If you don't have the right investor behind you, and you'll have a significant dislocation with them because they'll get nervous. Yes. They won't understand the game dynamics, how the monetization you know, works. Not only you have to do a great beta, but after beta you have to do constant live ops, right? For a freemium game, the content refresh cycles and then live ops, you know, guild events and all that kind of stuff is extremely important. If you don't have the right investor who doesn't understand the you know, game, it's not only game, but mobile game dynamics and, and really the user acquisition models and analytics and everything else, you'll have more problems than you, you imagine. And uh, I was gonna ask you, Henry, when, so you guys obviously did a great job of fundraising and, and we can do chest pounding, but that's not the intent here. Mm -hmm. But you talked to a number of investors. What were the questions that you were hearing from them? Yeah, I think, I think a lot, so taking a step back, um, and I think David's comments were, were really interesting um, regarding finding the next supercell. I mean, I, I you know, I, I might argue that there isn't gonna be another supercell you know, in today's climate. I, I don't know. I think we could probably debate that one for an hour. Um, but I think regardless, it's really important to define who you want to be and, and who you are, you know. And I think a lot of gaming companies are like, well, I'm a new company. I'm a startup. 
Well, not every company is a startup. You know, not every company wants to scale and become hundreds of people and, and grow exponentially that way. I mean, there's a great business to be said for, hey, I want to dominate a category. I want to be the, the best strategy developer in the world and I can make tens of millions of dollars a year doing it and make my investors very happy. And being able to articulate that and identify that and, and have that conversation and that back and forth with an investor and, and to really have a, a solid understanding from the get-go of, of what your ambitions are and how you're going to communicate them to the rest of the world Super important. Can't, can't emphasize that enough. I think a lot of the questions that, that we were getting, um, besides the what the hell are you guys doing, you're so stealthy and quiet, uh, was, you know, we're, we're really talking about sort of how we scale what we're doing. Um, you know, how, how does this scale? If, you're, if you guys are looking to raise 30, 40 million dollars, you know, what does this look like a year from now and what does it really look like two years from now and what are the tools that are going to get you there and, and how, why does it make sense? I mean, you know, the idea of, of growing a business and becoming the next supercell sounds great, but it, like, it doesn't just happen. You know, you really need to sort of plan out and understand, I think, where the ball is going, not where the ball is. So, you know, a lot of the stuff that we've been investing in and when investors would say, okay, well, what are you going to spend this money on? It's, it's building that infrastructure for us. That was our play. We, we are a startup. Um, you know, we've, we've definitely scaled in that way. We're not a mobile gaming studio um, developing games and we're not a content creation company, though we do create some content. We're really a platform. And so I think, you know, explaining that platform to investors and some investors were very, very savvy about what that meant and, and what that could do in the future and other investors just sort of didn't really understand that because it's a brand new vertical. It's a, it's a very complex space. It's constantly changing. So being able to explain what the key trends are, the key changes are, you know, how we're going to get ahead of them and what our competition is doing and how we're different, I think those were some of the key elements and some of the, the key questions that we were hearing and responding to. Yeah, and uh, you know, on the sort of, again, investor and, and entrepreneur alignment, uh, you know, whether we're going to have another supercell uh, or not, but you know, again, you have to remember this is a long journey. Before heyday, supercell had four games, and they really didn't do very well. But they had the right investors who stuck by them, and they fine-tuned their model. They sort of translated their learnings and came up with heyday, which really got them off to a great start. And then you know, clash of clans. So it's really a journey, and it doesn't really happen overnight unless you have sort of flappy bird type of phenomenon. But to really have a great game with great live ops and sustained economic model and, and longevity, it really takes a sort of team effort from both investors and, and entrepreneurs. I think at this point, unless you guys have other comments, we'd like to sort of have the audience participate and ask us questions and share your experiences. I know you have great entrepreneurs and, and fundraisers out there, and any battle scars that you want to talk about would be great. I want to have one comment on, oh, okay. the, on, the, on, the, uh, on the soft launch territories, like was mentioned about the Philippines. So um, the developers mostly um, think like, yeah, let's do like Canada or Australia or Philippines and not knowing, you know, the territory, uh, like the behavior uh, at the territory exactly. Like that was a huge surprise for me um, sort of a year ago that, uh, yes, Philippines are a great market for the retention, but most people are trying to measure their um, um, LTV and stuff there as well. But the funny thing is less than 10% of Philippines are having credit cards. So even though they are having accounts, they just cannot pay. And the other interesting thing that they do have the iTunes gift cards, but the iTunes gift card they have are only for United States. So the ones who can, who are able to purchase the uh, gift cards for their accounts and want to spend money, they have to register a US account to be able to spend money. So there is actually no way to think of the Philippines at the market that can show you your you know, future profits. And that's, that's the main thing. You have to think properly and uh, learn and study where are you doing and what are you doing and just don't forget about that. And as David said, I think the first you know, uh, focus is really on retention retention, retention, yes. then engagement, then monetization. If, if you don't have the first two, you're not going to have the third. So you really have to make sure that you know, in a game has great retention behaviors, and then you can look at engagement dynamics, and then with that you can sort of fine tune the economy, which economy should be really a sort of piece of the original game design as opposed to something really added on later. But love to get your perspectives and comments and questions. So anybody wanna, you know, t wants to talk about his or her experiences in fundraising? Challenges, opportunities, observations? 
No? There's one. There's one? There's one right okay. There. Hi, um, thanks for the great insight. Uh, I have rather a question about uh, what do you guys think of, you know, sort of, sort of the European uh, VC ecosystem, and you talked a little bit about it, uh, comparing it to, you know, definitely, as you said, I, th I think everybody knows that there's a little bit lack of capital in the European space compared to the VC world of Silicon Valley or the US in general. And also right now, especially in the mobile space in Asia, you see a lot of investment happening. You know, uh, you know specific markets like Korea last year had five IPOs uh, based out of mobile game companies. There are 10 planned uh, IPOs in Korea this year. So there's a lot of active uh, VC happening in Asia as well as in the US. Um, do you see that the European eco world, uh, if you could, uh, even call it a European ecosystem because it seems like there's clusters more like there's the London cluster there's the uh, you know uh, the the Nordics cluster maybe in Berlin there's one uh, and blah 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 but do you think it's going to improve and we will see similar um, you know success stories and also more capital more investment opportunities for developers and uh, you know startups who are starting in Europe compared to Asia or, uh, or the US. What's your opinion about the future? That's my question. Um, that, I mean, it's a fantastic question. It's a really good question. I think the first thing to say is that, um, you know, if you've got a, a, a great company with a great idea and you're going great, it doesn't really matter where uh, your, your investment comes from. Um, this is what, what uh, Unity did, you know, based in Denmark early on, but their Series A was let out of, uh, of Silicon, Silicon Valley. So it's quite possible to access capital from other parts of the globe. It works, it works well. Um, we are underserved here in Europe. Um, I'm not necessarily sure that's a hugely bad thing. You know, it just means that different types of companies are going to initiate and get going. I think it's very difficult if you come up with... So, so you guys, for example, fantastic job, really good job. They think, I think these guys would have really struggled to raise that type of money in, in Europe because, in all honesty, the European sort of capital markets don't have the vision uh, that they have in, in the US and sometimes in Asia, so they're unwilling to take those big bets. So the approach in Europe tends to be much more kind of step by step by step, start very early on and see how you can kind of scale the opportunity uh, with results as they're coming in. So maybe multiple rounds at a smaller level getting to a particular position. Um, I, I, in all honesty, I, I don't see Europe becoming um, as active in terms of, uh, of, of capital availability as, as, as the US or, or, or Asia. I, and I, I just, I can't, I can't see how it happens. And I, I'm not, I'm really not sure why that is. I'm kind of glad because, you know, we kind of have the space almost to ourselves. There are a few others who are active, but uh, none who are sort of game specific. Um, so I, I don't have an answer to your, to your question. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with everything David said, and the reason I'm here at this conference and, you know, flew across the world to get here is, is because I sort of see it similarly. I think there's a tremendous amount of talent here that does not have the same access to capital um, and, and the ability to get something off the ground in a meaningful way that a company, you know, in San Francisco might. Um, I think the interesting part about it, and feel free to, to come talk to me afterwards if, if, uh, if you think this is you, is that you know, there are potentially publishers out there who can help you to elevate yourself to a level at which you are now globally recognized and breaking down that barrier to say a Silicon Valley or you know, an Eastern region is a lot more realistic. You know, if you're a young company sitting in Copenhagen and, you know, you're trying to, to, do, to make a game, um, not create a platform or a piece of technology, it's incredibly difficult to get the attention of a VC based in San Francisco. I mean, you, you're, it's, it's a, a little bit of a fool's errand, to be honest. But, um, you know, and, and I'm sitting on the other side of the table and I really believe in, in our model and, and what we're doing, I do think that there's a, a lot of validity in the approach of saying, okay, I want to make the biggest thing I can possibly make. So 
find the smartest people I can work with, you know, find the, the people who are going to help me to scale this game in the best way possible, who are going to take an interest, who are going to focus on my product, and then after that, maybe I'll go to a guy like David and raise at five times the valuation, or have the ability to pick up the phone or send an email and, and actually get a response from a guy sitting in Silicon Valley, you know, halfway across the world, because I've got a game that, you know, was inside the top 50 grossing, and, and I've made a name for myself, and I've proven that I can execute and ship a product and, and do something really special. And, you know, the question you're not going to get from that person in Silicon Valley is, hmm, did you guys do your own user acquisition? They're going to say, wow, you guys made it a brilliant game, my son plays it, and I love it, and it monetized, and that's a crazy ARP down number, and your attention's off the charts, and I want to invest in you guys. You know anything from me? Um, yeah, so uh, I would say that um, venture companies are mostly invest, uh, investing not in the ideas, but in the team. So if, if you have the proven background in gaming, that's awesome. If you have a good background in maybe other uh, fields, but you're a good entrepreneur, the, uh, most of VCs also will also believe you. Because gaming industry, especially mobile in, in industry, is pretty young. So most people that are successful right now, they're successful entrepreneurs in other fields. And of course, depending on your uh, strategy and depending on your goals and depending on your needs, there's few ways, not only VC way, to get the uh, money raised for your company. So we can start with like friends, family, in fools, which is not the best way, but for a startup or um, you know, like few, few people uh, or indie, uh, that can be that can be a good idea. The other way is uh, also messaging platforms are investing in the game to get their games on board. Uh, also, big platforms like uh, Microsoft and others are also investing in the games uh, to get them on board. Um, you can also receive money from uh, the government. I know, like in West Lithuania and in Germany. There are special programs for um, game developments and IT field. So this is actually a good uh, approach to, like, let's say it's um, a credit from the government, but with no uh, no percent to pay. So, which is also very, could be a good approach for uh, for you if you don't want to, you know, share with the, let's say, the VC company or somebody that's gonna influence your decisions while while you're uh, working. Of course, angel investments and. Yes, this is. I, I believe I, there is also others, but I cannot remember right now. <laughs> the good ones, uh, I think the, what you don't have in the U.S. is the government sort of funding uh, for local governments. Uh, I, I, if you look at the market last year, it's a twenty billion dollar market, and in, this is the first year that China, South Korea, and Japan are combined is the largest market for mobile gaming. So out of 20 billion, they add up to approximately 8 billion or so. And you have US around 4 billion and Europe around 4 billion. I think the biggest challenge for European you know, developers is access to capital. Across all three regions, as David said, Europe's uh, capital allocation deployment model has been really sort of stagnating behind US and, and Asia Pacific. So that's a, you know, significant challenge, but there are some you know, alternative ways you're talking about. I was talking to a developer from, can't remember which country, they got significant money from the government to really get them off to a good start. And then, like you said, if they can prove themselves, it makes fundraising easier. Mm -hmm. But um, any other questions from the audience? Yeah, I have, I have one. Um, Henry, Henry, question for Henry, I'm right here. Um, Henry, what was the pivot point where you were able to raise another 35 plus million dollars? What sort of target did you have to reach to get to that point? In terms of revenue run rate or... or what, if, what was it? What was the measurement? I don't think... I, I wish there was sort of a, a, a single answer. You know, I think is, is the best way I can put it. I wish, you know, it would be a lot simpler if we said, okay, we have to get to a five million dollar a month run rate and once we do we've got access. I, I don't think it's quite that simple. You know, I think it was um, more about being able to articulate a vision and then being able to support that with trends. Um, you know, and so when we showed the, the revenue trends of Scopely, it was up and to the right and then some. You know, when we showed the user growth, it was the same. And so when you, and when you start to think about the, um, beyond that, even the trajectory of the quality of products that you're shipping, which is a little bit more qualitative, um, you combine that as a package and you try to articulate as to where you're going with that and, and what that means as a building block for, for future growth. Um, you know, I was really excited before when, when Marco said, you know, they're, they're con ready, getting ready for their next stage of growth. And that's exactly how we think about it. You know, if we're not growing every single day, every single month, then we're dying. And, 
you know, that we really believe that to our core and, um, you know, I think anybody who's worked at Scopely and the way that we operate internally in terms of sharing those figures and making sure that everybody understands what they're doing to contribute to that, you know, larger initiative um, is, is just culturally ingrained in, in what we're doing. So I, I don't think there's unanswered. I don't think there was a, a moment in time when we said, okay, now we can go raise X amount because of X, Y, and Z. It was more about sort of where are we heading? What do we want to do? You know, I, I, when we first started thinking about this raise, I don't even think we really knew exactly how much we wanted to raise. You know, we had kind of a, a range um, and we had an understanding of what we needed. Um, but I think it became more clear as we progressed through conversations with investors, we really thought about 2015, 16, 17, and, and getting into that, that state of long-term thinking and, and, um, and planning for continued growth. Because I think that, you know, if you are a startup, you, you need to be growing nonstop all the time, and you need to have the, the trajectory to, to be able to back it up. Okay, thank you. You are talking, uh, uh, I'm from uh, Lisbon, Portugal, and you are talking about uh, governmental supports in terms of the investment, what I think is great, but for my experience, at least in my country, it's a big mistake because as David said, and we already have an investment proposal that is from one of these funds, and we are su not super scared because money is, ma money is true, but all of the companies that I've been working with government supports, after the money runs out, they die. Because in the gaming business, you really need to have someone that understands this business and they understand how we need to grow. Because these guys receive money, they develop games, they are thinking that they are making the best games ever, and that's not true. Can I just comment on that? I mean, it, 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 you're dead right if that's the only source of funding. Uh, you know, it, it, the government is essentially subsidizing what will be an inefficient organization. But in certain cases, I mean, if you take Finland, for example, they have a program called Tekes. Tekes is fabulous in terms of supporting game developers. And from somebody who's investing capital, it's wonderful for me because essentially it leverages the amount I put in. So I know that if we're investing, say, you know, a million dollars into a company in, 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 in Finland and they've got a good relationship with Tekes, maybe Tekes will match that. So suddenly I've doubled my runway. So that can work very, very effectively. In the UK, for example, it's dreadful. You know, there is government support for certain things, but it tends to be so incredibly bureaucratic that the organization starts serving the, 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 the needs of the government rather than serving the needs of their customers. So I, I, I hear what you're saying. That's exactly the case. Um, Spain is interesting. We have some investments in Spain. Again, some of those guys have got some government funding, but that's associated with the fact that it's match funding with uh, VC money going in. So it's, it's there for a good reason. The, the other way of thinking about it, and, and you know, we're talking to a, a company in a different region of the world right now who, who's access to a sizable amount of government funding, um, relatively speaking, enough to at least essentially fully finance complete game productions. Um, what's interesting about that company is then they can come to us and they're not asking for financing, they're really just asking for more of a partnership. They come in the terms that they're getting when we're talking to them versus the terms that a company gets when we fully finance development totally different. So you can put yourself into a different position of leverage when then maybe going towards that smart money. You can get something that, that's a, a proof of concept, you know, or a prototype, or maybe even launch an, an early version of a game that, that you want to use that engine for, for the next really big one that you're doing with a publisher. Um, I think that that's a really viable and interesting idea. It allows you to have, I think, sort of what a lot of developers value when they start their business, which is creative autonomy, um, while still putting you in a position to then go work with some really intelligent people and experts in another side of the business, which is really getting it out there and scaling it. You know, have you looked, you looked into government financing and, and any sort of local funding from the... In Ukraine? <laughs> I mean, you, you brought up the idea. I was wondering. If no, the, the best thing in Ukraine when the government doesn't touch you at all. That's the best way. Any other questions? I think we're going to run out of time pretty soon. Excellent panel. I'm not just saying that because Marco is the most powerful person in San Francisco. Um, you say you wanted all the viewpoints up there, and I understand that chair space is limited, so uh, maybe there might possibly be one viewpoint missing, which is the strategic investor, the Tencents, the Netties, um, also smart money. I was wondering, um, you know, there are obviously uh, trade-offs there, if you guys might uh, discuss um, the pitfalls and pleasures of going with strategic investment. 
Yeah, so, so and, and again here we're talking about equity investments from strategics rather than project financing or something like that. Yeah, so it can work out incredibly well. Uh, the, the, for me, the real issue there is, again, again, dirty little secret VCs, we're interested in you exiting at some stage, so maximizing your value so that eventually we can get multiples of what we put in back. So we're always looking at, you know, what is your scope, your ability to be able to exit at some stage. If you have investment from a strategic, that could affect your exit possibilities. I'm not going to say whether it's positively or negatively, but it, you know, it may well be that uh, you know, it limits who you could sell to at some stage. It may, on the other hand, be you know, you're very well positioned for a complete exit to the strategic you're involved in. So I, you know, I'd say, say think through that process quite carefully if you're going to get equity investment from a strategic. Right? It's not just about getting that money on day one so you can get going. All right. It's also what, how is that going to affect you know, your, your next fundraise you know, and the next fundraise and ultimately your exit. And when you are thinking about fundraising, do think of it about that process okay, and what the cadence is going to be uh, and what the situation looks like in terms of your cap table and your ownership status for the next round and the next round and ultimately an exit. Great advice. So we're going to have to wrap it up. Um, thank you, Marco. Yeah, I just Great want to panel. say... Thank you very much. Really great insights, and I really appreciate it. Hopefully, this was helpful to you guys, and uh, much appreciated. Thank you very much.